Miriam Rivera, you are the co-founder and managing director of Ulu Ventures, an early stage investment firm. You are one of the faces of this year's 50 over 50 investment list. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was asking you before we started rolling what your greatest over 50 accomplishment is, and you say it's the company that you're running now. Tell us about it. Ulu Ventures is a seed stage venture capital firm located in Palo Alto, California. We uh, started fundraising from outside investors um, after I turned 50. So why is it your greatest over 50 accomplishment? Because it's really allowed me to give other people opportunities um, that have just been extraordinary for myself um, and that I wanted to give back to younger people, diverse people. Um, it's been a fabulous way to do that. Now you frame it as giving back, but you are looking for profits, you are looking for returns. And in fact, in your portfolio, there are 10 unicorns, which is not the greatest number compared to Sequoia, but that's a pretty large number for a firm of your size. How did you do that? We did that by identifying talented people who were really trying to pursue really big markets. And also many of them want to do something that supports a positive social end. Um, and we think that there's just great opportunities for them. We also looked particularly for teams that had diverse members uh, because there's a lot of data that showed in public companies, diverse board members could actually generate greater profitability. And that's what has turned out over the last 15 years to also be true of startup companies. They perform better when teams look more like America. That's right. So aside from looking for diverse teams, strong teams, good management structures, what is your investment thesis? What are the sector-based trends that you're looking for these days? So in enterprise software, we look for technologies that help make business more efficient um, and profitable. We looked for other kinds of businesses, such as in the healthcare well-being space, sustainability, financial services, innovation, uh, basically way, new ways of doing business. New ways of doing business. And those new ways of doing business have created 10 unicorns. And of those unicorns, five are run by women? I five understand. had a woman founder at the start. And actually, all of them still have a woman founder. Two of them have women CEOs. We're speaking in a moment where DEI has been under attack in America. The litigiously minded folks in this country, some of them say, focusing on women and people of color is actually reverse discrimination and you're leaving out white men. How do you respond to that and how do you operate in this environment when you have other funds with similar focuses that have been sued? Well, a lot of times people think diversity means minority only. That's not what we mean by diversity. Our teams have all permutations of people, all colors, all genders. Uh, there are plenty of white men in our portfolio. The other thing I would say is that really DEI is about having the customer in mind. When you think about growing a business, the main thing that you should be looking for is a large market. 70% of Americans are diverse people, meaning they are not white men. They are women, they are people of color, they are immigrant Americans. And they have different business needs perhaps than others. They're also uh, going to be the majority of the working population in the United States by 2030. So we really need to emphasize how technology needs to adapt for Americans today. Now, I know you have said that Silicon Valley looks like 1950s America. What do you mean by that? Well, it would mean things like women-led companies only have about 2% of venture capital dollars, but obviously women represent over 50% of the population. They also represent over 60% of the educated population in the United States. That's an example of how extreme uh, the change is needed in terms of trying to increase representation in business. And it's not going to happen with people who are opposed to uh, investing in the most educated and the best. And when you describe the business opportunity that you're seeing among the consumer market that's growing, would you say that the majority of Silicon Valley is missing out on a substantial amount of dollars? Yes, I would say that in part because one of our clients who is a very large pension has a number of firms in Silicon Valley in their portfolio. And when they looked at 
who they had access to at seed stage, they had zero of our entrepreneurs. All of these diverse entrepreneurs that represent, you know, I said 50% of them have a woman on the team, 20% of them have a Latinx on the team, which is much more correlated with the Latinx population in the United States. Um, about 45% of them have an immigrant founder. So we really have a diversity of team members, but 90% of those companies also have white people and white men on the team. I've heard other venture capitalists say that investing is an art and a science. And I've heard you kind of talk about using your intuition as you're assessing companies, but also putting data to that intuition. Can you tell us how you do that? Because you have a really interesting model. Yeah, we use a process called decision analysis that was developed at Stanford University by Professor Ron Howard. He helped us to develop a methodology where we actually use both intuition and data. So for example, we want to look at team risk, financing risk, market adoption risk, and product development risk. Every venture capitalist looks at those. What we do that's a little bit different is that we actually uh, develop criteria around each one at every stage in the life cycle of a company, and we put a number to the level of risk. What that allows us to do is learn, because in a couple of years when our companies are looking to raise capital, we'll see whether or not they had one of those risks actually materialize. We'll also see, let's say we had 10 companies and we said six of them were going to be successful and only two are. We would learn that we're not calibrated appropriate to the level of risk and we'd be able to get a sign of where the risk was higher than we anticipated. And so do you track, so let's say you're looking at company named ABC and you say the management risk is 60% and then let's say no negative event happens and it's a successful company, they have an exit, you know, they have an IPO, they have something great happen five, 10 years down the line. Do you then adjust your model and how you assign the numbers and the scores in your, in your model? What we would do to learn from that, and we've actually done this recently, we look back at what the distribution of returns is that we expected for the portfolio. We've developed our models for each company in exactly the same way so that we can generate a distribution. One of the things that we know about early stage returns is that they are power law distributed. They are not normally distributed. So for example, we expect most of the companies not to generate very interesting returns, but we expect a few of those companies to generate a great deal of return. And what will tend to happen is that really it's only the companies that get to the top of the market uh, in terms of adoption that will actually generate most of the return. What we see is that's probably somewhere between about 10% of the companies. And what we've learned over time is that both our first and second portfolios are actually positively correlated with that notion that the top 10% are generating most of the return and that we have a large portfolio enough to generate that return consistently. That's really interesting. You have a data-driven approach, but you also have a, an approach that I think, if I'm correct in understanding your life journey, has been kind of informed by that journey. You are the daughter of migrant workers and really watched your parents build a life from scratch. Can you talk about your childhood and, and what you bring from that childhood to your work today? Yes, my parents started off as migrant farm workers. They moved from Puerto Rico to Florida. Then they would work the crops between Florida and New York State. I was born in upstate New York in Dunkirk, New York. And they stopped doing that when my older sister got ready for school because they wanted her to be able to stay in one school district. So we moved to Chicago and they were able to find factory work through, each of them had a sibling that had moved to Chicago from Puerto Rico. So that's where I grew up. They, my, my parents both obviously worked very hard. Um, a lot of the times, lawyers have the worst hours of anyone. <laughs> I would say, in fact, they say that they're even worse than doctors these days. And my sense of that is nobody really works as hard as a migrant farm worker. So I knew that I was really uh, blessed to be able to do the kind of work that I have done both as an attorney and as a venture capitalist. You got to the attorney part before I did. You have four degrees from Stanford, is that correct? I do. 
I love the place. <laughs> <laughs> you were on their board for a minute there too, right? Yeah, and we kind of say I bleed cardinal because that's the name of our team. But speaking of the law, let's let's talk about your early days. So you get your law degree, you're working as a lawyer. You were hired as Google's second ever lawyer in 2001. That was early days for Google. What was that job like? It was a really fun job. Uh, I have to say it's one of the more fun jobs I've ever had. And part of it is growing a company from what was $85 million the first year that I was there to over $10 billion in five years is an incredible opportunity. It's really like climbing Mount Everest with some of the smartest people you could ever meet. Also fun because it was a real startup. Like when I joined, they would actually make the rack servers for the data rooms in the hallways. <laughs> and so I'd be walking over guys with rack servers and people that um, in the data rooms would actually be wearing roller skates to actually change out parts on those uh, servers. So it was a really fun time to work there gotten a little bit bigger in the years since? A lot bigger. I think it was $10 billion when I left. I think they closed a $100 billion quarter last time. And then before you founded your venture firm, you were also an entrepreneur. Tell us about those days. Yeah. I was an entrepreneur in the late 90s, along with half of Silicon Valley, uh, which was the first uh, boom. And this was a real time when the internet was still new. I had worked on an IPO as a young attorney that had only 39 million users on the internet in 1996. So we were early days um, developing software that would be used by enterprises. And you know there were many times when we had to go without pay, where we really would do every kind of work that was needed to get it done. So I would work as the attorney, a consultant, and also um, you know hire people, negotiate leases, whatever needed to be done. So then the evolution to venture founder, it really seems quite natural because I think to go from law to venture feels like quite a jump, but does the JD inform what you do as a VC? Yes, both the law and business school degrees really inform a lot of what I do. One, as a venture capitalist, you're basically selling securities. And I was a securities attorney, mostly working with venture capitalists and startup companies in the mid 90s before becoming a startup founder. And as a startup founder, you have to do everything that walks in the door. And part of what you're trying to do is build a business, um, but also keep your IP from bigger companies. So we were a small startup company, but we were dealing with uh, Fortune 2000 company customers, and they have huge legal team. So it was really helpful to have that background. You have witnessed the evolution of the internet basically from its birth to today. So, and you invest in internet and tech enabled businesses. So I'm really curious, you hear a lot of consumer concern about internet security, AI, social media, I could go on. But as you think about what everyday people are talking about and worrying about when it comes to the internet, what is a fear that you think is overblown? I think a fear that's overblown is that AI will put people out of work tomorrow. <laughs> Instead, I actually think that AI will help create more efficient ways for people to work and get rid of a lot of the drudgery of what they do. I also think that it will help them uh, to be able to do more interesting parts of the job. So for myself, for example, if I were doing a bunch of document review for uh, filing, let's say, I would have to go read everything, summarize it for myself, try to keep track of where it all is. I think uh, AI can do that more effectively and at least guide me to places where you need a human and human judgment to be able to find the things that matter. So I think it's actually a great tool and I think people are afraid when a lot of jobs really won't be replaced by AI, but I think they'll be augmented. It's true. I think about transcription services. I remember when I was starting as a reporter, very meticulously sitting at a desk with my recorder here and my laptop here and transcribing every word. And I think the rate, my rate of typing was slow. So it would take like eight hours to transcribe one interview. Yes. And I've gotten all that time back thanks to the AI services that just do it for me. Yeah. 
Are you looking for AI opportunities in your portfolio and in the startups you speak with? We are, although we're tending to look at applications of AI as opposed to infrastructural AI. A lot of the big companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple are all developing AIs, um, obviously OpenAI as well, that are incredibly powerful and they're spending tens of billions of dollars <laughs> to do so. Uh, competing head on with those is maybe something that Elon can do, but it's probably not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, so instead, we're looking for applications uh, where our companies can help make businesses uh, work cheaper, better, faster, uh, and also serve new customers. For example, a company that is uh, in our portfolio has applied AI to transcribing phone interviews that not-for-profits do with senior citizens that receive services from those not-for-profits. A lot of the times there's a government agency that's charged with making sure that seniors who don't have families are actually cared for. And the hardest thing they have to do is actually track down what's happening with a particular senior. Now, all of these records, like you, it takes a lot of time to transcribe all of the phone messages that you've uh, gone through with respect to a client. So now an AI can help do that for uh, the not-for-profit worker and get that into the system so people know you know, Beth's food was late or not delivered and she can get the services that she needs. Oh, that's really interesting. Now I talked to you about people's fears. Flip side of that question, because you're looking at internet trends, technology trends, what is something that you're seeing percolating that is exciting that the consumer public is not talking about or realizing? I think related to AI is the fact that we can develop software that's much more cost effective for areas that really don't have the same kind of budgets as the private sector. So we're seeing industries that are referred to as laggard industries like education or government, not-for-profits, be able to afford software that really meets needs that they have but might not have been able to afford before. For example, one of our portfolio companies is developing a technology to help not-for-profits be able to fundraise. And that's something that can be done with an AI more effectively, perhaps, than with other methods. Miriam, we are speaking today in New York City and not Silicon Valley, because you are in town for a board meeting. And I love this board. Can you tell us? I'm here for the Sesame Street board meeting. It's actually called Sesame Workshop, but everybody knows it as Sesame Street. How did you get on the board of Sesame Street? I will call it Sesame Street, because I grew up watching Sesame Street. It is a funny story in that they asked a number of diverse women if they would like to be on the board, expecting maybe one person to say yes. But instead, they ended up with about five of us on the board. Uh, and all of us, because we had our own unique Sesame story. What's your Sesame story? As I mentioned, I was a Head Start kid. I spoke Spanish first. I didn't learn English until I was in Head Start. And Sesame Street was really one of the ways that my parents help me learn English and get ready for school. You have a really interesting statement that you've made, which is, you know, I doubted there were many Googlers whose early childhood education consisted of Sesame Street and Title I Head Start, who had earned four Stanford degrees, co-founded a venture-backed startup, and would develop technology services agreements that would generate billions of dollars for Google. The long shot can be very profitable. You say that about yourself. Is that what you look for in entrepreneurs, the long shots? I'm really looking for those long shots because in a power law distributed world, you're looking for long shots. It's really uh, the few that will generate a lot of profitability. How are you finding them? It's looking for talent in places that others don't look. So, for example, we really look at diverse teams that include women, that include people of color, that include people of all genders, uh, that uh, in immigrants, for example. And there are um, huge markets in problems that people don't identify in venture capital as being huge. For example, one of our companies also uses AI and computer vision to create hair uh, lace that is used to custom make wigs. This is a market that 
is addressing the needs of a large number of women, predominantly black women, but also women with hair loss from disease. And they had the experience that even though they were this super dynamic team of two sisters, Nigerian immigrant, black women, one of them had a BS in computer science, a master's in electrical engineering, both from Stanford, a PhD in computer vision from MIT. Her sister had a Wharton undergrad and MBA, and they could not get a meeting in the East Coast to address this market because people think it's not a big market. When we analyze the data, it turns out that this is about a $12 billion market. We think that it can be uh, kind of the Warby Parker of wigs. That sounds like a huge business, but you have your eyes open, at least, so someone's funding them. We're funding them, but we were the first venture firm that took a meeting with this team. How many times in your career have you been the first or the only? Have you lost count? <laughs> I think I've lost count, and I don't want to, and my firm is trying to do something about that as well. I have a partner named Maria Salamanca, who's obviously also Latinx, and we also have a young senior associate, Andrea Bogarin, who is uh, Peruvian also. We talked a little earlier about your comment about Silicon Valley looking like 1950s America. Do you think it is changing? It is changing. Over the last 15 years, the number of firms that have been started by people of color has really exploded. In 2020, we did an analysis of the market and determined that about 50 firms that were led by black and Latinx founders had actually made about two thirds of all the investments in African American and Latinx founders in the United States, and that would number fewer than 100 investments. So since that time, there's probably about six times as many firms. Wow, so it's growing. It's growing and we have dynamics where right now venture capital is out of favor and year over year investment in firms has gone down by 70%. Venture capital is out of favor, or is it just that we had the frothiness of 2021 and the exuberance of so much investment that everyone's being a little more conservative with dry powder these days? I think it's both. So one, we did have a lot of exuberance, but two, we also have a lot of safe yield um, coming in from government debt and treasury bills, for example. If you can get a guaranteed 5% rate of return uh, that's backed by the U.S. government, I think that's a pretty good investment for a lot of people. I think that makes sense. As you look at your career, let me ask everyone on the 50 over 50 this. When you were in your 20s and 30s, did you ever imagine your career over 50? I had to admit that I hadn't thought about being 50 ever. <laughs> I think that was beyond the point when I could think. Uh, when I was a kid, I really thought of setting goals for myself. Uh, and most of them I've met. And the last one that I did meet at 50 was actually running my first marathon. And I haven't written my book yet. That's another thing that I want to do at some point is write a book. So as a teen, you, you made a list of goals. And on it was run a marathon, which you've done, write a book, write a book. I wanted, I thought I would get married. I wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted check, to check. raise children. Uh, so those were on my, like, I knew I wanted those things, but I didn't really know um, what would come after that point. Is being over 50 an advantage or disadvantage in your line of work? Well, some would say that it's a disadvantage. When I first uh, started to raise capital for Ulu Ventures, I asked an experienced venture capitalist for a referral to a limited partner, which is an investor uh, who invests professionally in venture firms. And he told me that venture was a young man's game. <laughs> and so I was really left astounded uh, because I'd served on a board with this person. I think he knew me fairly well, but he dismissed me out of hand. And that's not the first time you've been dismissed. Earlier in your career, when you were a co-founder of a venture-backed company, you were a new mom, and one of your investors was a little opinionated about how you should be spending your time. Are you willing to share this story with us? Yes, uh, I think it's a mark of its day, but I had my daughter on Friday. I went back to work on Monday, and a few months later, I was told that by a director, if it were his grandchild, he'd prefer the mother to stay home. And I was asked to 
leave my firm. You were asked to leave. And that's partly because a new set of venture capitalists were coming in and they did not want a husband and wife team. My husband and I were co-founders at the time of the startup. I certainly felt that it was a bias against working women and certainly marital status bias. So what I'm hearing is, as hard as that moment was for you when that investor said that awfully biased thing, you heard in that you were not wanted and you would be better off finding somewhere that you would be valued and you would be accepted. That turned out to be the case for me. I ended up at Google, which turned out to be a pretty good place to work and at a pretty good time. I think it's really important for people to identify a place where they'll really be given a fair shot um, and to find the right investors and the right supporters. If you don't do that, I don't think you can build a great career. As I look at your career, it feels very intentional at every step. You have the degree, you become a lawyer, you work for Google, you take that knowledge and you eventually become a venture capitalist and combining all of the above. Over the years, there were some moments of uncertainty. Is there a moment of uncertainty that stands out, either a decade or a job or one incident that you think back to and you at the time had no idea how it would work out? I have to say that Google was partly like that. Uh, we were growing at the fastest rate of any company in American history, and I was literally the second person in this department, and we were overwhelmed uh, by the volume of work uh, on our team. At the first few weeks, I opened 130 different legal matters, and I really didn't think I could prepare folders anymore because it was just too much volume. So part of my challenge and a fun problem to solve was how do we handle that much volume? And so a lot of the work that I did was actually re-engineering processes compared to just doing legal work. I ended up shortening our contract from eight pages down to one page, for example, because the fewer words there are on a page, the fewer things there are to negotiate. Then I tried other approaches um, from even fast food operations to try to figure out how do we get the volume through so that we don't slow down the revenue growth of this company. So a lot of my challenges were operational as opposed to legal in nature. Well, I was going in that direction about uncertainty because I think so many people feel uncertain at different moments in their career. So taking that example, what did you learn about navigating through career uncertainty while you were at Google, navigating that deluge of business? One is I learned that I'm a pretty good surfer and that I think you have to have that mentality. I'm not a surfer, really. I do have a child who does it. Um, but it's really understanding that you are riding a wave, that you are in hyper growth, and that a lot of things will kind of fall to the wayside. One person said, should I give away my cat and my plants? Because it was not a time when you could have balance in life. So I think part of it is just realizing that there are moments in your life when all you'll do is just try to keep up. And if you can do more than that, it's gravy. If we speak again in a year, two years, five years from now, what do you want to be able to tell me that you've accomplished or that Ulu has accomplished? The best thing that we could do in the next three, five years would be to actually return capital and more to our investors. They are foundations, pensions, higher education endowments. They're all doing amazing things in their communities, providing scholarships, research that makes us all better off. They're providing for pensioners in their old age. We really want these companies to win so that those investors can win.